Hello, welcome to another edition of Hobby News Daily. I'm still Danny Black, and today I'm joined by Cage, or as he's known online, Cage Lawyer. How are you doing? I'm doing good, Danny. Thanks for having me on. No, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. So uh, you, you've been in the hobby for quite some time, and you've been on air for quite some time. Uh, <laughs> when, did, when did you actually start collecting, and do you remember kind of your first pack? Sure, sure. Uh, um, I collect. I started collecting in the '80s as a kid. Um, before we get into the hobby origin story, there, I want to thank you for having me on, man. Um, one of the biggest questions I get all, all the time from folks is, uh, "How come I don't do more shows? How come I don't do more interviews and stuff like that?" And the honest answer is, people don't ask me. And you know, I, I've actually asked some, you know, some podcasts like. You know, there are some who want me on, like, you know, as a regular. Those guys, they have egos. You know, they have some fun stuff. But I've asked a couple of folks, like, hey, how come you don't have me on? And most people say, because you don't shut up. And you won't let me get a word in edgewise. So I will start off by saying, Danny, I go on tangents, man, as you can see already, one minute in. So just wave your arms, say stop, say shut up, you know, rein me in, do what you got to do. We'll have some fun with this. But seriously, thank you. I am uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a wild card. So... A lot of people don't want to have me on the show, but hopefully it makes for a fun little episode for uh, for what you're doing here. Hobby origin story, it's an easy one. Um, you know, by the I'm way, I bill, I bill by the hours. I bill by the hours. So <laughs> talk as much as you want. Nice. I love it. So I'm uh, born in Brooklyn, grew up in Staten Island. Um, you know, I was uh, I was a nine-year-old kid when the when the 86 Mets were huge, but I was a Yankee fan. Uh, so it was a little bit difficult, you know. All the all the Met fans, all my friends became, you know, quick Dwight Gooden and and Daryl Strawberry, you know, lovers. And I I had Don Mattingly and you know, and, and his 1984 tops cards. Um, you know, my my uh, my first pack. Whew, um, I know that set that I fell in love with was 87 tops. But I was buying cards and oh, collecting sure. cards before the that. The McGuire. I mean, the McGuire. Anyway, 87 tops from yep. McGuire, Todd Van Poppel, if I'm correct. Yep. So 87 tops would border. Van Poppel didn't come to like 90s. Was he um, not? But, but 87 tops, it had a McGuire card. It's funny that you go right to McGuire because 87 tops, easy packs, green box, would border. You know, you buy, you know, cards for, you know, for, for pocket change. Um, but – when I found out that McGuire, who obviously was huge at the time, had a card before that, I started buying 1985 tops. He has the Olympic team card. And I remember hand collating as a kid a 1985 tops set. Hand collating guys, this is, you know, you used to buy the cards, you go to stores, you buy packs, open it up, and you, you, you put together a top set, 792 cards. I even remember to this day, I've talked about it. Um, Len Sakata of the Orioles. He's got glasses on. Was the last card I needed to complete the set. I'm in Baltimore. I'm in Baltimore. Len Sakata has a special place in my heart. So that was the last card that I needed. And people know this. Every once in a while, someone will send me a link of the Len Sakata 1985 PSA 10 that's on eBay. They're like, you need this. You know, you need this for your collection. And so, I mean, as far as, you know, packs opening, the first pack I opened May very well have been, uh, you know, a 1986 tops card. You know, the black top might have been an 87. I don't remember the first pack, but I know 87 tops was sort of like the the one I fell in love with. I was 10 years old when that came out, um, and that brought me right over to 85. Then it was just build every set that I could of baseball sets. I think I still have most of them in my basement. Um, a couple of years back, I pulled out all the good cards and sent them all into PSA to grade. But I got a lot of sevens, so. Yeah. That's about right. There's the um, yeah, I mean, so you and I, from the 80s, you and I are about the same, uh, you and I are about the same age, um, almost identically. Um, you eighty four Mattingly, Tops mm -hmm. or Dunruss? Which one do you like better? Dunruss, and only because if you were a kid on, on my street, if you had the Dunruss one, your parents had a good job. You know, like you were doing okay. <laughs> I never had. I never had the Donruss as a kid. I had a beat up tops copy. Yeah. Um, and uh, I had the 85 tops. You know, I, I was more tops. Um, you know, in the 80s, you kind of knew uh, classes of the of the kids based on what they had. Um, if you were a Met fan, 
and you had Dwight Gooden's Topps card, you were doing good. But if you were one of the rare ones that had the 84 Fleer update Gooden, woo, forget about it. You had a dad who was spending some serious coin on cards for you. You know, you walked out with that one and you were all set. Same with the Clemens, same with the Kirby Puckett from that year. You know, the 84 We, we were the Cal Ripken. You either had the three player rookie card or you had the Topps traded, which, traded. You know, if you had that Topps traded, you know, you 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 were the you know the, the bee's knees, you know. Right, and it's funny because if you had the Ripken rookie for Fleer or Donruss, those you didn't want, which right. changed. I mean, eighty-two Fleer, you know, because they came out in eighty-one, eighty-two Fleer, um, you were like, eh, I'd rather have the tops. By the time it got to eighty-four, you know, and you were talking about Daryl Strawberry or Don Mattingly, even the 83s to some extent. I still want to tops in 83 of like Sandberg and Wade Boggs and those guys. But 85, you know, Donruss, 86, you wanted Jose Canseco in the 86 Donruss because he didn't have an 86 tops card. And all of a sudden you're like, wow, there's other cards out there. There's other stuff you can chase. They didn't put, put Canseco in until, you know, the, uh, the traded set. So a lot of fun, a lot of fun stuff that you, uh, you know, I could talk about each year of cards and tell you who the rookies are, but you don't want to hear that. That's not going to make for a good totally episode. Wrong on Van, I was totally wrong on Van Poppel, and thank you for correcting me, by the way. Um, he was upper deck. 89 upper deck Griffey. Were you a fan? Yeah. Were you were you one of that people who had 25 of them like I did? Because that's right when I was starting to be a dealer. So what's uh, funny about it is 89 upper deck came out. I was 12 years old. All right. Yeah. And um, yeah, everybody knew Griffey. I still have an old um, Beckett magazine with Griffey on it signed. And Ooh. one of the, what is it, like Bellingham Mariners, like a minor league. And then there's like a San Bernardino spirit. I have some autographed ones of those, never graded, just have them in my basement. An 89 upper deck. But what's funny about it is I remember cards getting really big in 89. And you knew they were getting big because no matter where you went, the kids were talking about them, right? Like I was in, you know, youth football, youth soccer. You know, I did all kinds of different sports. Um, you know, not with the school in leagues, you know, where I was, sure. where I was from. And you had different friend groups for the soccer team, and different friend groups from school. And everybody was talking about cards, and everybody was talking about eighty nine upper deck. It was the first pack that ever cost a buck. I remember that. That was a big deal. A dollar pack. And it was, it was a foil pack. Foil pack. Yep. Yeah, tamper proof had a hologram on it. We didn't know what the hell a hologram was, but there it was on the back. And the poster child was Griffey. I mean, they put him at card number one, and Tops didn't have him until the trade had set, and and score didn't have him until the trade had set. Remember the year before, Greg Jeffries' score was a huge thing. So people were like, what's score gonna do? You know, Donruss had it, Fleer had it, upper deck was was was, was the killer card. But here's what's fun. Yes, I bought a bunch of them. But I learned a hobby lesson very early about chasing and not chasing. People don't, might not remember this, but Griffey was actually hurt in his rookie year. Yep. And Griffey did not win the rookie of the on year. The, on the catch up the wall with his ankle, if I'm right. Yeah, he hurt himself. And I I don't – was it a – you're a Baltimore guy. It might have been a Baltimore Orioles pitcher who won the 89 rookie of the year. And over in the, uh, Greg, over in Greg the National Olsen. League – Greg Olson, you see that? So Greg Olson, see, that was who won. And, and you know, you, you, so, but over in the National League, the NL uh, um, Rookie of the Year, there were two guys who had huge um, seasons in 1989, and it was hype. And it was uh, Dwight Smith of the Cubs, right? Yeah, and yeah. Jerome Walton. They were on the same team. Yes. The Cubs were huge. You had like Andre Dawson was there. And and they finished one two in the in the rookie of the year race, and Walton had an upper deck card in like the extended set. It was like the upper deck extended, and I'll never forget. I took all of my Griffey Junior cards. I remember the, the Beckett magazine coming, and like the price of Griffey was going with the down arrow, and price of Walton when he won the rookie year. And I'm like, anybody who has the Walton, I'm trading my Griffey Juniors for Jerome Waltons, and did one for one Griffey. For Jerome Walton. The only Griffey I wound up having left was one, one it was in my factory set. You know, I bought like an 89 upper deck factory set, which I graded and got a seven. That's just what happens, I guess, for the factory sets. I think you need seven. to change I think you need to change your handle too. I I got a seven. 
Yeah, just um, no, almost every card I pulled out seven. My Kirby Puckett from my eighty-five top seven, just sevens everywhere. So why send it in? You already know. You make your own company. Everybody's doing it. You know. Um, <laughs> I have a theory, and tell me if I'm, I'm crazy or if there makes sense to this. The fifty-two yeah, mantle. The fifty-two mantle is kind of the logo of the hobby. It's not the best. It's not his rookie. You know, cheers, by the way, to caffeine. Um, I think the 52 mantle just has been the picture of the hobby. I think the 89 upper deck, Griffey, is that card for the next generation. Completely fair. I think okay. if you were writing a book on, you know, the, the, the iconic cards or you were writing an encyclopedia of sports cards, those two cards are on the cover. You know, from basketball, you probably have your Jordan, 86 Fleer, you know, football. Sure. You know, you can probably come up with a bunch of different ones, right? I mean, if you look at from modern football, you know, maybe you have the the, the Brady, the Brady or maybe Brady. you have a <laughs> rookie or Ray Rice rookie, something like that. But, but yeah, I mean, iconic for more than the, the card itself, 100%. And far more than the value or the significance of the card might deserve. And that's not an insult. Yeah. Please, in the comments, I'm not knocking a 52 mantle. I would take I would take one if you want to mail it to me. You know, feel free. No, um, from a personal standpoint, I think the best way I can kind of expound on what you're saying is, I've tried to, you know, I don't want to say consolidate my collection, but there are guys I PC that I have a ton of cards of. Right, I have a, a, a Drew Bledsoe collection like you wouldn't believe, and we can get into that. The Fourth time you have me on because it's not something people want to hear about. Trust me. But Griffey, in my PC, I had two Griffey cards. Right, I had an '89 Upper Deck PSA 10 that I bought, you know, in I think 2017 for 300 dollars in PSA 10. So when it went to four thousand dollars, I didn't sell right. it because I was like, yeah, whatever. Right. Now it's a thousand and change. I'm still not selling it. You know, it is what it is. It's just one of those cards that I always wanted to own in really nice shape. And it, you know, it speaks. But I also own a Skybox Rubies Griffey, uh, okay. which is a rare card, numbered to 50. You know, it, it checks a lot of boxes for a lot of collectors, a lot of hobbyists, a lot, a lot of insiders now. And when I was going through, I call them kind of my own hobby audit. I do them, you know, every couple of months, every quarter where I go through what I own and, you know, I want to reposition, I want to liquidate, I want to be able to have some money to buy some other stuff. I had the two Griffey cards in front of me and I said, hey, I want to whittle down to one Griffey. And then I have some other Griffeys, one high end, one four figure Griffey, let's call it. I have a lot of other, you know, hot gloves and, you know, Griffey stuff that will we'll call back nostalgia. But I said, you know what? This Rubies does not say to me the same thing that this Upper Deck was. I know there's more Upper Deck 89 Griffey than anywhere. There's millions of them. Interesting. Right? I still okay. Rubies. All right. So, yeah. Do you, any, any regrets? No. No, the, uh, the, it's going to sound ridiculously cliche. I, if, if I spent as much time talking about the regrets as the regrets that I have, I would need to do, you know, 10 more podcasts a day. You know what I mean? Like, oh. and it just, it's not a healthy thing. You know, we could, we could spend time here, all the cards I should have bought, all the cards I would have, should have, you name it. But you can do that anywhere. Everybody should have bought Bitcoin the first time they heard about it because can't then get, they can't can't sell get. it today at $70,000. Know? I just keep my therapist on retainer. Ah, this is yeah. therapy. You're my therapist today. I'm not paying therapist, you know. And and by the way, that is a very important kind of thing. And it, 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 I guess I should thank you on behalf of people who are listening for you because it is therapy. You know, the the content that you're putting out there, the stuff that you put out on your website, even ridiculous interviews like this for somebody like me today. You know, somebody's gonna go to work today. They're gonna have a bad day. Their boss is gonna yell at them. Someone's gonna you know gonna give them a hard time. Their kid's gonna give them a problem. There's gonna be a car accident. It's gonna be some you know stress of of daily life. It's just the way the world works. And maybe on their commute home or maybe driving in the 18 wheeler. I got a lot of guys who drive rigs, big rigs who listen to me. You know, maybe you're out there, you know, listening and they throw this on for a half an hour or 40 minutes. And this is what calms them down. This is the therapy. This is the stress relief. That is the hobby for me. It's why it's, uh, you know, uh, the best hobby in the world, why I will never leave it. Um, so don't have a therapist, just listen to hobby content and you can't have regrets. 
right? Because this is where you're supposed to be coming to not have those regrets. You're supposed to be coming here to kind of escape that daily BS that we all have to deal with. So I kind of like, you know, you could probably find that on Instagram without looking too hard, right? You know, they make the they make your windshield so much bigger than your rear view mirror, right? Because you're just right. supposed to be like looking forward, you know, forget about looking back, that kind of BS. You got to get the poster on the wall, you know, like with the picture, you know, the motivational posters. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're doing. Well, well that's what we're doing. Um, okay. So what last card you bought um, that, 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 that top of your head that really made you smile. The last card I, I bought, like the last card that I purchased that made me smile. Yeah, so it's really funny. Made you smile. Like not finishing a set, you know, sometimes you're just, you're buying. Yeah. One Let's think about that. I'm, I'm trying to think. So, so, I mean, high end stuff. Um, in 2002, when I started, um, that's not the last thing you made me smile, by the way, but I got to tell you, know, it's always a storytelling, right? You were going to read it in the therapist conversation if there I, was. I, I, I got out of law school. I started making some money. Now I had plenty of law school debt and the whole deal. But I remember buying a um, cards with my first paycheck, like the extra money. I bought two cards. I was always in love with the Gaudi set, the 33 Gaudi set as a kid. I thought it was the coolest color. I thought it was like, you know, we call it like bubblegum cards. That was the first bubblegum card set. You know, it holds a special Mo place for me. My, my Mo there Berg. You go. Berg. Yeah. Berg. Berg's a good one. A little Mo Berg. So I bought a um, a, uh, a Gehrig in PSA 5. And I bought a Ruth in PSA 4. Neither one of them were four-figure purchases. So I should let you know kind of where they where they are now. So you know a, I mean? a little bit you know, more those by the way, if you're watching, it's a little bit more than the Moberg. Yeah. Well, I mean, I paid a, a couple hundred bucks each. I think the, the Gary was like 300. The Ruth was probably like seven or 800. And I was like, oh, big spender. You know, like I, I finally I got a paycheck. I could go. I can, I can, you know, I can buy myself something. I still own both of those cards. That's right. Awesome. The Ruth is still in the same PSA slab. The Gehrig is not. I actually got it re slabbed at the last national. Um, you know, I've been running over to Nat Turner crying because somebody looked the card up and was it was like deactivated because people were trying to like use the same uh you know certification number to fake one and he's like well this is clearly the real one because <laughs> it hasn't seen daylight in decades but um oh anyway this you know so that's in i like the old slab but but over the next couple of years i started building a gaudi set right so nice. it's not a set completion but it was one of those things and i, I you want to talk about regrets i passed on buying a full set that had a, a, a Nap Lajoie in PSA 4. I never got that card. It's one that I do want to own. But the roof that I never was able to get was the yellow one. Always my favorite. I bought a green one. I bought the cheapest one with my, you know, my, my paycheck back in 02. I never got one. And last year, I picked up a really nice looking PSA 4.5. So not like an 8 or, you know, not, we're not talking about like a crazy, but not a, not a cheap card. Um, it may actually actually be worth less than what I paid for because a lot of people who bought things in like 2022 and early 2023, the cards have come down in value, but it doesn't matter to me. That was one that I really wanted to own. It was a real nice four and a half, nice centering, has a little like stain on the back. Maybe I'll send it to a friend to kind of clean the stain off, wink, 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 topic for another day. And, uh, you know, we'll go oh, from right. there, but it was just, if you go, if you go to yeah. Hobby News Daily, there's an interview with Kurt from Kurt's Card Care that was posted in January. Just, you He's gotta there. throw that out there. Interesting fellow, great team behind him. By the way, he's got he's got uh, uh you know he posts pictures of it. International Women's Day. He's got a team of women that work there. That's why he's so successful. The hobby needs to learn a little bit about you know a little diversity there too. But anyway, it is what it is. I digress. Like I said, I go off on tangent. So that was a fun one for me because it, it kind of tied in generations of buying and and you know and collecting. Um, that really definitely made me smile. You know, more recently. I actually I smile most when I open packs with my son and we open every Friday, literally okay. every single Friday we open something. And we've done that since the start of COVID just because it was something to do when there was nothing to do. And it kind of has carried forward. Uh, last Friday we opened um, MLS finest okay, looking for Messi. Sure. And yeah. we pulled a super factory. It was the first super factory we ever pulled. This is someone we never heard of because we don't really watch MLS. It wasn't, 
messy. Yeah. Over here, he's like, I got a super fractor. So, you know, that definitely made me smile because it's something that will stick with me forever. The super fractor is probably worth about 20 bucks, but it doesn't matter. You know, it, I was like, oh, I got one, matter. you know? So that was, that was fun. You know, from the, from the PC perspective, you know, um, I st- I've, I've listened, I have a weird ex- expansive taste. I like type ones and I'll tell you, I haven't, it's like an exclusive. I don't even have it yet, but the last auction win that I had, which is going to make me smile, right? Definitely going to make me smile is my tastes are all over the place. I like music. I like, you know, anything that allows me to be sort of a guardian of history. That's a cool thing for me. So I have like a a type one photo of Muhammad Ali's first professional fight. That's kind of cool. Can't be too many of those out there. Um, you know, some of these, some of these, these cards, I think are, are sort of uh, history. Well, anyway, at an auction house that sells a lot of type one photos. I'm a Staten Island guy. I mentioned that I was able to get, it's a, a type one PSA hasn't slammed it yet, but it's coming your way guys. It's a type one of lucky Luciano's mugshot for when he was first arrested. A type cool. one. A th- yeah, it's, it's an original mugshot photo from when he was arrested in Arkansas and then brought to New York and finally was you know, put shit. in jail the whole deal. Yeah. I thought that was like a cool piece. I, I know hobby people, you know, this is really expanding the definition of hobby. It's not sport. It's not a card. It's, it's not anything like that. It's a type one photo. But I mean, like, I'm a Godfather fan. I like the mafia stuff. I knew a lot of people who were in high school with me who went into witness protection. That's not a lie. A lot. And so that's a cool genre for me. And this, I saw this and I was like, wow. And you want to take a guess how much it cost? And this I may mean, be the I'm only one of these. It, it would slide, I think it would slide under the radar a little bit on the coolness factor. Um, it was $1, less $1, than $600, $500 and oh, change. Wow. That's a nice yeah. buy. Yeah. And I'm like, this, this is cool. But even if it's just like, oh, one day. My podcast will actually have a backdrop like you have with, you know, the, the show you slabs and that stuff. And that'll be cool. It'll be back there. Hopefully, you know, type one PSA slab when they get it. You know, it's got like the news article on the back about how, you know, we can't call him lucky today because his luck finally ran out. He's arrested and being held on $350,000 bail, which I'm sure was huge in 1936 or whatever the hell it was, you know. So, um, yeah, I mean, so that th- when I finally get that in hand because I won it this past weekend. But if I finally get that in hand, that'll be cool. That'll make me smile just because it you don't it doesn't have to be a thirty thousand dollar Babe Ruth card. It can be something else that's just cool. And you're like, hey, check this out. Look what I just bought, you know. I just got this from uh Com C, uh 36 Babe Diedrichson from the nice. uh, Olympic the Olympic uh, Mule and Frank. This auction um, had a cool type one photo of both of the Babes. It had Babe Ruth and Babe Diedrichson together. Posing in really? the thirties on one photo, I, I I I bid on it, but I did not win it. Yeah, it was cool. I I'm I'm starting to PC multi sport athletes. Yep. I decided that would be a fun one. I'm a huge Bo Jackson fan. You got a Jim um, Thorpe somewhere? Jim Thorpe. I'm more, I want I want to get the sports king. You know, um, yeah. but you know, it gives There's me, it gives me a yeah. So it gives me a project, and I, you know. And the Babe Diedrichsons are so hard to find, you know. Or, you know, not that they're hard to find, but so, the good ones are hard to find. I'm trying to think of other fun multi sports for you that you could pick up. How about a Bronco Nagurski? You count him as a multi sport? Well, how about Danny Ainge? Yeah, Danny Ainge. I mean, <laughs> Ainge definitely. Um, yeah, you know, uh, but- Nagurski <laughs> wrestled, right? So he wrestled and played football. I mean, yeah. you got Dave Winfield, who was drafted by four well, professional sports leagues, right? Four leagues, but he only played in one, so I'm torn on that one. Now, my son, my son said to me, my son said to me, would he have been in the Hall of Fame in another sport? And I said, I think as a tight end in football, um, he would have had a chance. So he might only because I like him. Tell me who are the tight ends who were in the Hall of Fame who played in the '80s and and early '90s. It's tough. Now you think of tight ends who are much more involved, and Winfield would be like a, a you know a Gronk or a Kelsey type now who are sure shot yeah. Hall of Famers. But tight ends were used differently back in then. It was Ozzie Newsom. It was uh, what you might call in San Diego. I'm drawing a blank. Um, but yeah, Antonio no, Gates. <laughs> no, no, no. Before that, before that, I'm going older. But, um, but yes. Hmm. Um, anyway, so multi sport athletes is my new is the new PC. 
So that's cool. Listen, you gotta have something. You know what I mean? You gotta have something. Well, I'm from that's Baltimore. What, that's what makes collecting cool. I did the 54 Orioles because first year in Baltimore. Nice. So also a so, colorful set. Very colorful set. For the yeah. Color. And there's nothing expensive on the 54 Orioles because they sucked. So it was a real easy PC. Huh. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. I like it. You have to have a Billy Ripken 1989 Fleer era card, though. That would be the, the pinnacle of – there it is. There you go. Yeah, there you go. That's, it. Uh, That's well, what I'll never sell. I own that. How do you choose a PC? Like, what what turns you on for a PC? Anything you own is your PC. No, no, but like, we if use PC for like a category. Do you ever go like yeah. for a category of stuff? Sure. Um, so, I mean, PC, remember, I mean, it's a personal collection, right? So, anything you own right now is part of your PC. I mean, we we use it PC to kind of be like stuff that I'm going coffin cards, stuff that I'm not selling, stuff that I'm keeping, I'm building, and you know, we get the, the connotation of that. But I mean, I think anything you're buying, you know, is considered your PC. So, as far as like building a collection, listen, when I was, it's funny. A lot of it is luck, and a lot of it is timing. You want to talk about regrets? I, I sometimes wish that I was born, you know, eight years later. Because if I were born eight years later, I'd be a wealthy, wealthy man. Because I started collecting, um, you know, in the '80s. But my my brother was two years younger than me. My dad worked and stopped working. And 1993, just everything came together where cards were getting huge. They were still, you know, doing the write up from the late '80s and hadn't done the this yet. Just like we are right now, the write up. We haven't done the this yet. Um, and 93, the, there was an expansion into other sports and Shaq came in 92, 93 and basketball got, got huge. It wasn't Jordan that got basketball huge. Trust me, guys. I was there. It was Shaq. Um, and people were trying to buy hockey cards, just like they're doing now looking for Bedard. It was looking for Team Mussolini and you had, you know, a bunch of other guys who were playing, you know, like Eric Lindros and, and, um, and, and other guys, but football became huge. And it was the first time I remember people saying, we have to chase the quarterback. And yep. Rick Meyer came out of Notre Dame, and Drew Bledsoe was the Washington quarterback, Washington State. And Bledsoe was the number one pick, and it was like, you got prospecting quarterbacks. And so I see what's happening now, and I kind of like, I laugh. Like, I wish I could invite all the quarterback prospecting kids now over to my basement <laughs> so they could see my Drew Bledsoe collection because we basically we treated it like it was our job. Like, we went to shows. And bought every Drew Bledsoe card we could find. It didn't matter which one. We weren't like focusing on like the best one. It was like any Drew Bledsoe. Yeah, like we, it was known. We're gonna buy you Drew Bledsoe cards. Now imagine if eight years later I did this, I'd be buying a bunch of Tom Brady cards. Be a different yep. story. That's why I'd be rich. So I mean, you know, sometimes it's you know your your PC. I'm a Drew Bledsoe collector because I'm stuck with it because nobody wants them. I've offered them to Drew. I've offered them to Drew's mom. She, she doesn't even want the cards that I have. Um, so you know, you kind of get stuck with a PC. Griffey, I mean, people love the 89 upper deck. I mean, anybody who was a kid in, in 1989, 91, 92, like, you know, any of that Griffey formative era, he changed the way you looked at baseball. You know, the backwards hat, the chewing gum, you know, the athletic plays, and just, you know, the smile through it the whole time and what was otherwise a boring old man sport. You know, it made baseball different. It made you kind of fall in love with a game that America had been in love with for decades I, I always sort of say but I always say because his father was on the team it let America say it's okay because the, the his father was an old school player and his father was okay yep. with it yep yeah I mean I think that's cool I mean look and you know there are plays where he would like jump in front of his dad and steal a fly ball out and, you know so it's it fun stuff right um but it was just they he was having fun out there and people wanted to copy that. People wanted to play baseball again because it was it was where you could have fun. So, you, you know, as a kid, Griffey holds a special place. A lot of young people now are like, why Griffey? Like, he never won anything. You know, he, he never set the record for home runs. He never won anything. He never was a champ. He never won a ring, and blah, blah, blah. And I, and I get that. I, I can't tell you. It's just you had to be there. And when you combine Griffey with the change in cards in the early 90s, I was by 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 the mid to late nineties. I was already in college, so oh, that, that I wasn't the same. Everything, yeah. yeah. I wasn't like a rubies or a PMG guy, 
But hell, when you got a hot glove, a die cut card that's in the shape of a glove from Flair, like I'll buy every one of those. That is cool. You know, Zenith came out with Doofex cards, which have like rainbow foil on them. You know, you had, you know, there weren't numbered, but you had artist proof and museum collection from Pinnacle with the shiny foils on the cards. Yep. You know, hell, inserts started, team leader inserts, which were ugly as sin, but they were something different in a pack in 1992 than just buying a pack and getting the same cards of the people in the set. The, you know, some of these things kind of changed the hobby. Those are cards I own. Like, I own every Ken Griffey Jr. hot glove and every Ken Griffey Jr. team leader card. Um, and most of them PSA 10s. Some of them, the PSA 10s, there's like pop one, pop three. <laughs> Yes, I don't well, I assume, some of those. And I assume you've got a bunch of PSA sevens as well. So no, no, those I want. <laughs> those I want. Sevens, you know, they're like a buck now, you know. I mean, from what the ones I graded, those are sevens. So That's I don't so even right. grade them. You're right. I learned my lesson. I learned my lesson. But how do you choose right. with PC? Listen, it's easy. Buy what you're gonna smile about. You know, I mean, you asked a great question, which is what's the last thing that, that you bought that made you smile? Buy something that when you pull it out and take a look at it, it, it makes you smile. It makes you, you know, have some nostalgia. It makes you think back to being a kid. You know, I pull out the hot gloves and I remember being a kid riding my bike to the card store a few blocks away from my house and opening a pack of Flair, which had like a gold pack and a black on on it each pack was sealed in plastic and you opened it up and if you got a hot glove or a tidal wave or whatever it was right on the back of the pack so you knew when you're opening it up wow look i got one who is it go flip it over it's griffey you know like like their cards have the ability to kind of take you back to a time where you didn't have a job and stress and all this shit that's what yep. you should pc something that you pick up and instantly you are transported back to a time where it was all smiles that's it. I, I I love the sentiment. It's why Hobby News Daily exists. Um, I do it as a labor of love. I'm certainly not getting rich off of it uh, yet. Yet, feel free to advertise. Um, but I that's advertise with him. Buy him out. He's ready. A couple We're million takes go. it. We're good to go. <laughs> um, but I want to, you know, the statistics show that people listen for about 12 minutes, um, and so I like to keep it to to write about where we are. Um, but I want to have you back because, because I want, I've got like another three hours worth of questions for you. So if we, if we could do this again in the future, I, I would love it because this has been two way therapy. Anytime. Listen, and you know, wherever this gets posted, guys, if you want to put comments out there, you know, put a little comment in there, you know, is, is this boring by too many tangents? Should they, should he have me back? Should I shut up a little and let him talk? talk if you want once in a while let, let, let them know what you think and anybody else out there who wants to have me on and not let them talk and just talk myself and not take a breath for 33 minutes you know how to find me i'll go on anybody's show <laughs> it's a remarkable skill to, to 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 not breathe that long uh cage thank you very much for joining me i really appreciate it um i will see you in the green room but uh where can everybody find you Get, give your information I mean, it's pretty easy. It's Cage Lawyer on Instagram. The next time I come on, I can explain that for anybody who wants to know why it's Cage Lawyer. And yes, I am a lawyer. Um, well, I'm not. I just stayed in the Holiday Inn Express last night. But it's Cage Lawyer on Instagram. Also, The Hobby with Cage is my podcast. Got 125 episodes of that in the last 11 months. You can find me anywhere you get your podcasts. And also on YouTube, The Hobby with Cage. Um, every Tuesday. We post the little hobby news ourselves. It's just 60 seconds. Very different than what you do here. But if you haven't checked that out, check it out and let me know what you think. Thanks, everybody. Well, I appreciate you having, you know, being on. And to everybody else, we will see you on the next episode of Hobby News Daily. Thank you.